Bruce, en contra de muchísima gente contemporánea, apuesta que sí se puede predecir. Ha sido un negociador internacional reconocido en muchísimos ámbitos. Ha sido no solamente un negociador, sino que ha sido evaluado con 90% de éxito en negociaciones en conflictos internacionales, en relaciones de socios importantes, en relaciones de pareja. Veamos su metodología y qué podemos predecir, por ejemplo, de Irak, del conflicto del Medio Oriente, de lo que vivimos hoy en día. Quédese con este pensador que sí le atina lo que predice. Bruce Bueno de Mezquita. Político científico, profesor de la Universidad de Nueva York y Senior Fellow de la Hoover Institution. Se especializa en las relaciones internacionales, política exterior y en la construcción de la nación. También es uno de los autores de la teoría Selectorate. Es fundador de la empresa Mezquita and Roundel la cual se especializa en hacer previsiones en materia de política exterior mediante un modelo informático basado en la teoría de juegos y teoría de la elección racional. También es director del Centro de Economía Política Alexander Hamilton de la Universidad de Nueva York. Fue presentado como el principal tema del documental de Next Nostradamus, donde se detalla cómo el científico está utilizando algoritmos informáticos para predecir futuros acontecimientos mundiales. Bruce, with your own words, for the Mexican audience, who are you? What do you do? And what do you think it's relevant for, for the people to know it? Uh, as, as you indicated, I use mathematics, I use a, a branch of mathematics called game theory uh, to predict people's behavior and also to change behavior. Uh, and so I, I've done a lot of uh, consulting and advising uh, with the United States government, also with private companies on how to solve complex problems. Uh, I've done work on analyzing what actions Al-Qaeda is likely to take, what actions they're not likely to take. Um, I've been talking to people recently about ways to resolve the dispute between the Israelis and the Palestinians. A pretty, pretty big subject. And for what it's worth, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States, uh, which has used the models that I've designed by their account several thousand times, uh, they put the accuracy at 90%, so uh, it works. Very impressive. What are the questions, what are the inputs that you need to actually create a methodology yeah. and from there on say, well, this is what we can predict and this is what we can do to change what could happen? First, I work very closely with the client to define what the questions are. And the questions have to be issues for which concrete decisions have to be made. People have to decide, do they want to negotiate? What would they consider, what, what, what position do they say they want? How could they be persuaded to take a different position? So the inputs are, who's going to try to influence a decision? Taking the landscape of where everybody else is into account allows me to calculate how they trade off between credit and outcome. And that means that when I model a problem, so the model is dynamic, it predicts people's positions changing over time, and who is convincing them to change their position, and what they believe about their relationship with each other person. What will happen, for example, in a negotiation where, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to use this term as an economist, in elastic response? I mean, yes. you want to negotiate probably with another party, but the only thing they want to negotiate is that you, for example, disappear off the map. Right. What can we do there? So, uh, there are people who will just stick to their position, and there are people who will give up their position to get credit. So there's uh, both extremes. One of the things you do with people who won't budge 
is you try to create a sufficient mass of influence at a position that is better for you that that person becomes marginalized, that they become unimportant to the process. If they can't be taken out of the, of the process, you know, then you can't solve the problem. Um, but one of the things to try to do is to use a, a game theory term is to separate types. So there are, there are the type of people who will go down in a blaze of glory for what they believe in, and there's the type of person, finger in the air, they'll do what any deal as long as they are seen as being important. Most people fall in between. For people who will just not budge, you have, if, if they have a veto over outcome, there's nothing you can do. They may be bluffing, however, so you don't, just because people say they won't budge doesn't mean they won't budge. There are such people, but many of them are bluffing, and many times what happens with such people is they stick to their position for a very long time. They see everybody else, the whole mass of power has moved someplace else. They're all alone. Many of them at that point will begin to collapse because it's just too costly to be stuck out there on their own. I've used that very feature to predict political successions. Uh, I'll give you an example. Please. My very earliest prediction uh, in print. In 1984, uh, I wrote an article, it was published in 1984, predicting who would succeed Ayatollah Khomeini when he died in Iran. Iran experts, I was very careful to say I'm not an Iran expert, Iran experts read my article and they laughed at it. They thought it was silly. The reason they thought it was silly is Ayatollah Khomeini had said who would succeed him. He had designated Ayatollah Montessori. I am Montessori in my analyses was, he was not quite that hard line, but he was not skillful. He was always very far away from the winning position across lots of issues. And two people in my analyses were always in the center of the winning positions, Rafsanjani and Khamenei. So I wrote my article in 1984 and I said the successors will be shared leadership between Rafsanjani and Khamenei, not some vague mm -hmm. statement that later got interpreted that way, by name to be shared by Rafsanjani and Khamenei. Khomeini died five years after the paper was published in 1989, and it was Rafsanjani and Khamenei. Because Montessori and some others were not good at positioning themselves skillfully politically, they allowed themselves to get isolated. They didn't play the game well. Of course, at the end, a lot of things have to, have, have to do with incentives and to understand psychology of the people. What could be the most important criteria for a negotiation in these terms? The ego of the counterpart to save your face or, or, or actually the politics that surround you? So uh, it's some of each. And again, these two dimensions try to capture that. In a way, Bruce, do you have like a, I don't know, a metric to evaluate ego of the, of the parts of the... I, I, I do, it is a complex formula that is in essence calculated so that that stated position, this advocated okay. position, is used in part to estimate uh, how willing each of the decision makers are to take risks or how uh, fearful they are of, of taking risks. So okay. a person who locates very close to the position where the bulk of the power is aggregated, if they've chosen this strategically, it is because they don't want to be out on a limb. They're, they are fearful of taking risks. But when you calibrate the risks that people take, so that you, mm -hmm. you, you can calibrate uh, how much they value things, alternatives, you can see what you have to give them and because the model is dynamic. And so gradually the players are learning who's who in the game and who's most efficient to go after and who's not. And they solve the problem. So it's, it is, in the economist's terms, incentive compatible. Both sides, for their own purposes, for their own interests, have the reason to maintain the agreement. Uh, one of the unfortunate things in negotiations, for example, between Israel and the Palestinians is that the focus has been way too much 
on land for peace or peace for land. Give up land and then the other side will give you peace. Or give up your weapons and then the other side will give you land. And these both lack what in game theory is called credible commitment. If I give you land, it's very, very costly for me to take it back if you don't give me peace. So you're no longer a danger to me. Claro. It's a bad solution. And there are good solutions. Please. So give us a little bit. <laughs> a little, very, very briefly. Um, a plan that requires no trust on either side and would move them in the right direction. It's not a settlement, but it moves them in the right direction. Is for 40% of government tax revenue from tourism, only from tourism, is automatically given to the Palestinians and 60% to the Israelis. Why is this a good thing? Tourism is extremely responsive to violence. On the Israeli side, a single death, Palestinian or Israeli, costs 1,300 tourists three months later. So for the number of deaths that actually take place, Israel loses about a quarter to half of its tourism every year, and the Palestinians lose more. If, they, if the Palestinians provided a peaceful environment by policing their own side, and likewise the Israelis, then the amount of revenue that would flow to the Israelis would be no different at, at, at a reasonable projection sure. than now, and the Palestinians would we'll increase by, they get 40% of this money, which would be, for reasonable conservative estimates, a billion dollars a year, which would be a 20% increase in their gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. It's not loose change. At a 20%, imagine a 20% growth rate. If there's violence, there's nothing lost in this because there will be no additional tourism, no money's being given away. Bruce, really, it has been an honor. Thank you for your class, for your free consultant. <laughs> Thank you for being part of, of Revolution, to think differently. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias. Espero que hayan gozado y aprendido de Bruce, bueno, del mez de Mezquite, como su servidor y como los que nos encontramos aquí en este bellísimo lugar de Long Beach, pensando sobre pensando, no solamente en los problemas, sino qué podemos hacer para resolverlos. Bruce Bueno nos ha tratado de convencer que sí se puede predestinar, que sí se puede pronosticar, que sí se puede predecir, sobre todo cuando tienes una teoría de juegos exacta y bien aplicada a las negociaciones. Al final de cuentas, ¿usted qué piensa?